in the next section, we're going to discuss the one important physical property that we see with chiral molecules. This property is called optical rotation, and we're going to discuss a related term called optical activity. To start, we're going to first, first look at the structure of light and how we can make that light have a special property. So light itself is made up of small waves of electricity and magnetism that we call electromagnetic waves. These waves come in little tiny packets that are called photons. Each photon has an oscillating electric field. In other words, an electric field that goes from positive to negative to positive to negative charge as the photon moves through space. When you have an electrical field that is changing the magnitude of its charge, that generates a magnetic field perpendicular to it. So this electrical wave then has a perpendicular magnetic field and the overall electromagnetic wave looks kind of like this as it moves through space. What we're going to do is we're going to ignore the magnetic wave, which is really just produced as a consequence of the electrical wave, and focus on the electric wave itself. If we imagine a beam of light, it looks, it can look sort of like a cylinder of light in moving through space. The cylinder is composed of just a huge number of individual photons, each photon with an electrical field, and each electrical field oscillating in space in a different, but possibly in a different direction. So if we were to look at this cylindrical beam coming straight toward our eyes, we would see sort of a circle, and then we would see photons oscillating in this direction, photons oscillating in that direction, in that direction, in that direction, in every direction as we go around the angles of the beam. What we can do is we can take that beam of light, which has electrical fields oscillating in all directions, and we can pass it through what's called a polarizing filter. A polarizing filter is uh, essentially a, a, a filter that has small slits that the light can fit through and then some other material that absorbs light. If we pass this beam through that filter, what we see is that any photon which is not perfectly aligned with the slits, so for example in our uh, exam in this example here, in this drawing, the slits are aligned perfectly up and down. Only the photons that are aligned perfectly up and down would be able to pass through the slits without hitting this other material and being absorbed. So that the beam that comes out after going through the polarizing filter would have all of the photons aligned with their electrical fields in the same direction. This is called plain polarized light. Optical rotation occurs because chiral molecules rotate plain polarized light. So this is a picture that shows how this would work. We would take a light source, we would get a beam of light. The photons would be aligned in all different directions. We would pass them through the polarizing filter, filtering out all of the photons except for the ones that are perfectly aligned with that filter. In our example, these are, uh, are oscillating perfectly straight up and down, perpendicular to the, I'm sorry, uh, parallel to the edge of the page. We would then pass that beam of light through a sample cell that contained a chiral molecule and specifically one mirror image of a chiral molecule. 
when a photon going through that sample hits one of those chiral molecules, it would be rotated a little bit. As it progresses through the cell, it would hit one molecule and rotate a little, would hit another molecule, rotate them further, 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 until at the end it exits the sample cell and it's all of the photons are basically aligned in a different direction at a different angle from the way it was aligned when it entered the cell. So we call this rotation in angle we call this the optical rotation or observed rotation of the light when it went through that sample. The observed rotation is given the symbol alpha and to indicate that it's observed rotation we put this little subscript of OBS which stands for observed. Now the observed rotation is not perfectly constant. It depends on many factors. For one thing, each chiral molecule of a given mirror image will rotate that light a small amount. But when we send that light into a sample, there are many chiral molecules. So the light will hit many chiral molecules and be rotated multiple times. So that the rotation that we see at the end is the net rotation caused by adding up a whole lot of little rotations. If we then imagine that we change the concentration of the sample, when you increase the concentration, you put more molecules into the space of the sample. The light would then hit more molecules causing it to be rotated a larger amount. So the observed rotation is going to depend on the concentration of the sample we started with. Furthermore, if we were to take this same volume of sample and put it into a different cell that was narrower or skinnier but longer, the light would travel for a longer distance inside the cell would have more opportunities to hit molecules and therefore it would also have a different, probably larger, observed rotation. Finally, it turns out that the extent of rotation also depends on the wavelength of the light and the temperature of the sample. So you can see there are a lot of complicated variables that we have to be careful to control in order to get reproducible measurements on a given sample. In order to make this more useful then, we're going to do a couple things. First of all, we're going to try to measure our observed rotation at a given temperature. Typically that temperature is 25 degrees C. We're going to use the same wavelength of light every time. What is actually typically used is the emission line the fourth emission line of sodium, which is called the sodium D line. What this basically means is if we take sodium and we heat it to a very high temperature, the electrons become excited because of the very energetic collisions that occur at the higher temperature. And they essentially get promoted to higher orbitals than they would normally be in at the ground state. They then fall down from those high orbitals back down to the orbital in which they belong and they release a photon of light with the same energy that was lost when they moved from higher to lower orbital. If we go into a dark room and we use a, a, spec a spectrophotometer to separate out the different wavelengths, what we would see is that different specific colors of light or different specific wavelengths of light are being given off by that superheated sodium. These show up as colored lines on the black background of the spectrum and you may have seen this kind of diagram in your general chemistry book. What scientists did then 
when they first were categorizing or cataloging these lines is they would give letter designations to each individual line starting from the far left. So the first line would be the A line of sodium and so forth. What we're going to use is the D line of sodium, the fourth line of sodium, which is basically sort of an orangish color light that comes at about 520 nanometers wavelength. We are also going to have to control for the concentration and the cell length. And the easiest way to do that is to take the observed rotation, divide by the concentration of the sample and the length of the sample cell. These have to be uh, done in specific units. So for example, the concentration is always molarity, moles per liter, and the length is always in decimeters. If we do that then, we get a new value for alpha. This new value should be reproducible at every concentration, at every cell length for the given wavelength and temperature. And so it becomes a reproducible physical property of that molecule, of that specific enantiomer. And it is given the name, the specific rotation. It's given the symbol alpha in brackets with a capital letter D subscripted, the D representing the D line of sodium. The alpha D is a physical property. So if we have a 100% pure sample of an enantiomer of a molecule, then the alpha D will always be the same magnitude and it will always be in the same direction, which could be either rotating clockwise or counterclockwise. The direction is indicated by the sign, the mathematical sign, either positive for clockwise or negative for counterclockwise. The significance of the specific rotation is that the two enantiomers of a substance will rotate when they are pure. They will rotate the light in the same magnitude but in completely exactly opposite directions. Now, the specific rotation can't be predicted from the R or S configurations of the chirality centers in a molecule. In fact, when we have single chirality center molecules, we will see that sometimes the R enantiomer will have a plus rotation, and in other compounds with different atoms in it, it will have a minus rotation. So therefore, we can't predict just by looking at a given uh, enantiomer whether the light will rotate in the positive or negative direction. However, if we have a given enantiomer and we know which direction that light would be rotated, we do know that the opposite enantiomer would have light rotating in the opposite direction. The other thing that's important to note is that if our samples um, contain mixtures of both mirror images of an enantiomer, then the amount of rotation that we would observe would be reduced because the light would go in, it would hit one enantiomer rotate a little bit in one direction, but then it would hit a molecule of the other enantiomer and rotate back in the opposite direction, causing the total rotation to become smaller. In fact, if we had a 50-50 mixture of those enantiomers, so we had the same number of each, then we would expect our observed rotation to be approximately zero because we would Hit, sometimes hit one enantiomer and rotate in one direction, then we'd hit the other enantiomer and we'd rotate back, and that would occur approximately equal number of times. This then leads to some terminology that is useful but also potentially confusing. What we say is that if we have a sample of a substance, and that sample's 
rotates polarized light, then that sample is said to be optically active. To be optically active, a sample has to contain chiral molecules and it has to have an unequal amount of the two enantiomers of, those, of the molecule. Now, a mixture that has exactly the same amount of two enantiomers, in other words, a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers, is given a special name. It's called a racemic mixture. The important thing about a racemic mixture is that a racemic mixture is not optically active. While the light is actually being rotated inside the sample, the net rotation is zero because as much as it's rotated in one direction, it's rotated the same amount in the opposite direction. We often indicate a racemic mixture by putting both a plus and a minus stacked up on top of the, each other in front of the name, thus indicating that both po positive or clockwise rotation and negative rotation are occurring in equal amounts. So if a sample doesn't have a net rotation of plane polarized light, we say it is optically inactive. This indicates one of two different things. It could mean that the sample doesn't contain any chiral substances. Molecules that are achiral, in other words, not chiral, these molecules don't rotate plane polarized light. Or it could indicate that the sample contains a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers of a chiral substance. The confusing thing is that optically active has, in some cases, become sort of a synonym for chiral which is not really a correct usage. So we have to be careful about how the language is being used and, and look very carefully to understand what somebody may be stating about a particular sample and the way it interacts with plane polarized light.